Welcome everyone to the Barbell Logic series, Hard Won Wisdom, Decades in the Arena. I'm your host, Nikki Sims, and we are joined by guest host, Jillian Ward. Okay, welcome back, everybody. I'm here with Jillian again. And we've talked a lot about how to handle like mindset of training and the ups and downs of it and kind of the experiences that we kind of develop in our relationship with training over a long period of time. But what I really want to get into today is what about like the nutrition and body image component of all this? Because that tends to be something that becomes really important to us at certain times and you have to eat if you have any goals and you have to eat in a certain way if you have any physical output related goals. So I have like a bajillion questions for you about nutrition and I think we'll save that for another series, but kind of like I'm curious about some of the long-term things that you've noticed, but let's do an icebreaker and let's share each of our pre-workout meals. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's yours? So those of you that know me know that I work out um, at a ridiculously early time of day, which is... Oh my God, so early. I'm probably finished long before most anybody wakes up. I'm generally in the gym before 5 a.m. Wow. Okay. So yeah. my pre-workout meal is a cup of coffee. Okay. And there's no food for me at that time of day. Now, if I train later, that changes a little bit. How so? But before we got on, we talked about, <laughs> we had a little funny exchange about I had done something differently <laughs> this past week. So for me, it's a cup of coffee, a fairly large cup. Actually, sometimes it's my Barbell Logic mug from last oh, Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I do two tablespoons of half and half. Oh, okay. Well, last week I got fancy. And the holidays were approaching and I started slipping a little bit with my choices <laughs> and I decided to buy two flavored creamers. I bought pumpkin spice mm -hmm. and everybody's favorite peppermint mocha. Mm. So last week, one morning before lifting, I decided I was going to have a nice creamy holiday flavored coffee in the morning. A long story short, it gave me the worst <laughs> indigestion ever. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, I the funnest get... thing to do when you have indigestion is a deep squat. <laughs> yeah. And even better is like putting a belt on. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so lesson learned on that. It's just like, it's whatever you're used to. Yeah. Like in terms of changing something up. So for me, I don't feel like I need to eat. I like to be awake for 45 minutes to an hour before I start lifting. Oh, okay. That's cool. So... I don't roll right into it, yeah. but let's say, you know, I used to lift at a time. I used to coach very early in the morning when I owned the gym and I would lift at like 930 in the morning, mm -hmm. but still have been up for maybe 330 or 345. Wow. So I would have had a meal. I can't say I was always consistent with it, but for me, I want to have enough food. It's pretty balanced. I've yeah. got some carbs, some protein, some fat in there, and mm -hmm. I want to have enough food, but I don't want to be so full and uncomfortable yeah. that it's uncomfortable to put a belt on. That's the worst thing is when you have just too much in your stomach, too much liquid, yep. too much food, like just like an air bloat. It's just, yep. ugh, it becomes distracting. <laughs> and I, I don't have a perfect meal. I know there are some things that have changed as I get older. Like my body doesn't handle all foods. Like something like a banana might repeat on me mm. and may not be a good choice. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Like I tend to do like this combination usually of like oats and eggs mixed together with like some fruit in it. Yeah. And I'll do that as a pre-workout meal. I like that. That sounds pretty good. I will usually have, and I work out at different times now, like evening workouts, Mondays and Wednesdays, and then like later workouts on Saturdays. But it's usually oatmeal with raisins and cinnamon. And like prior to that, I'd like to have had like a real meal like a couple hours before that has like protein in it, but easy to digest. And then like my 6 a.m. workout for jujitsu is like half a banana with almond butter. Couple scoops of pre-workout. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> which i'm always like really afraid of like i probably shouldn't have it before jiu-jitsu because i'm like well what's this gonna do to my body am i gonna explode <laughs> but i really want to wake up i think we become so superstitious too mm -hmm. and there are things that work for us or like one day you'll have a bad experience with the food and you won't yes. try that again yeah i know for me i had this meat superstition so like my pre-powerlifting meat what would be my foods and what i would eat at a powerlifting meet and I had 
a very unhealthy obsession with something called an Uncrustable. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I know what you're talking about. Those are for like toddlers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so they're peanut butter and jelly filled pockets. And we're not talking like organic peanut butter or, I mean, they are a frozen pastry shell, probably has a shelf life of three years <laughs> yep. filled with peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> so I, I'm a huge peanut butter and jelly fan. But one of the reasons I chose it, this is before COVID, everything else but I knew that I was going to be handling it with very dirty hands during a meet and touching oh, a million things, yeah. touching barbells, everything else. And I was able to get it in my mouth and handle it mm -hmm. without touching the food. And the other thing I knew is that it was so well preserved that I had absolutely zero risk of like foodborne illness or like it coming to a bad temperature and spoiling. Yeah, like you have a chicken sandwich in your lunchbox for four hours. Yeah. Like, this is the perfect time to eat this. <laughs> so I chose a super processed food <laughs> that became just part of like, I mean, tradition for me. And then it was like, oh, this is what I need. I hit my biggest squat yeah. with an Uncrustable. This is what I'm going to do. I am not recommending that's what people do. <laughs> not sponsored by Uncrustables. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> they have chocolate filled ones now, though. <laughs> what? That sounds delicious. <laughs> so, Jillian, you've worked with hundreds and hundreds of people on their nutrition, right? Yes. And from what kind of sports and what kind of aesthetic goals? Ranging. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it could be aesthetic goals like wanting to lose weight and understanding where lifting has a place in weight loss and the importance mm -hmm. of it mm -hmm. all the way to an extreme end of a pro bodybuilder getting ready for stage. But most of the people that are just, you know, regular people that want to look better, they want to feel better, mm -hmm. that this is not going to be their life. Okay. So there's a degree of where they're willing to take it with their nutrition. There's an amount of time they're willing to commit to their training. So I would say most of the people that I worked with fall into that norm. Mm -hmm. Are there any trends or behavioral patterns that you see quite often? So some trends or behavioral patterns, maybe let's say in people that you work with for like a year or two years, like do things kind of creep up that you're just like, that you see from client to client to client when you work with them for a long amount of time? Because I imagine there are certain things that come up when it's just like the first three months, but what about on the longer end? So related to nutrition yeah. and performance, nutrition and body image? Yeah. Ooh, I would love to hear both. Okay. Yeah. So it really depends on someone's rationale for starting. So when somebody comes in, you know, the prescription is going to be some, I'm going to get people under a barbell, whether they came in because they want to get stronger and they understand, or they want to feel better, or they want to not hurt, mm -hmm. or whether at the end of the day, they just, they want to look better and don't understand all of those things. But the approach and how you talk about it with somebody, like for me, is going to be different based mm -hmm. on those things and what the outcome is. Mm -hmm. Like do similar problems creep up after six months? Are ever people, do people ever be like, ah, oh, I'm just so done with like tracking or I'm so done with having any restrictions or? Yes. So initially I find people extremely motivated and very excited, whether that's to make changes to their body, whether that's changes to their form, whether that's weight on the bar. Mm -hmm. And usually if somebody's hooked within the first couple of weeks, I know that I've got their attention usually for at least three months. Oh, okay. So for me, with women, sometimes shorter, whatever, not shorter than three months, but because linear will run its course mm. sometimes before it does for men, I know that I'll hook them for the first three months. They're going to come in, you know, they're going to continuously be putting weight on the bar. And for a lot of them, if they've never done that before, their body's going to start changing mm -hmm. without doing a whole ton of other stuff. Yeah. And the other thing what happens is though, they start comparing themselves to the results other people around them are getting. Oh, that sounds like not a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> generally in like the three to six month range, what I personally find is that those results in terms of performance start to slow down a little bit. Mm -hmm. All of the excitement isn't there. Right. And nutrition would need to be a little bit dialed in in even further. Mm -hmm. But for some of the women, the ones that are willing. So here's where things get very confusing. Like with men, we're always telling them to eat. Right. Yeah. Eat more, eat more, eat more. You'll get stronger or at least men of a certain age group. Yeah. We're telling to do that. Mm -hmm. Every now and then we'll have a female that will come in and just wants to get stronger mm -hmm. and is willing to eat and eat and eat. Yeah. Most women come in and they want to get stronger, but they do not want to put on 
weight. Right. So they're willing to put on lean mass, but they're not willing to put on any junk weight to get there. Totally. And with women, unless they are underweight, I'm never going to encourage them to put on like unwanted weight to get there. Because at the end of the day, I think we've both experienced when they do, they're relatively unhappy. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to strike that balance to find out where to feed them enough where they're able to still make gains. Yeah, that sounds really tough. <laughs> As like a female who would be like, yeah, I want to weigh like 175 pounds, but just 100% lean. Sorry, when we talk about long term, it just occurred to me that I find a balance. I do a shift back and forth in order to keep women on track. A lot of times I will allow them or encourage them, not allow, encourage them to pursue a strength goal for a period of time and not worry. You know, I'll help not worry about what they see in the mirror, all of that stuff. And when they start getting to a point where they're maybe a little bit uncomfortable, we'll work on aesthetics for a little while and oh. we'll change course. Not everybody that comes into the gym is interested in being a world-class power lifter. Yeah. So it's really understanding why they want to be there. And I found going back and forth between an approach that is, you know, purely performance related and then backing off on the performance and really addressing nutrition and possibly even focusing on aesthetics for a while hmm. and kind of going back and forth between those approaches will keep somebody going for longer and they'll be happier. Oh, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that. So it'd be like, let's say you and I were working together. I come into your gym and I'm like, Jillian, I want to have really thick thighs and I want to look like these power lifters I see on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Like, how would you dig into what that really means for me? So I will sit with somebody in the beginning and it's all about managing expectations because what they tell me and what I hear and what I think they mean mm -hmm. may not be aligned. So yeah. when somebody comes to me, that first discussion I have with them, usually what I'll do is I will get them under a bar first. Usually when somebody feels like the positive blood flow of exercise and all that other stuff, they're willing to kind of open up a little bit more. Mm, like, I mean, really? exercise brings out some great stuff in people. Oh, how neat. And after that, I will sit them down in the office and I'm going to tell them, like, tell me the truth. Like, what is it that you want? And I will help them. I want to know that I have a full understanding of what it is that they want. And sometimes people don't want to say what they want. They're either yeah. embarrassed to say what they want, you know. It's a little bit of reading between the lines, yeah. but I will again have follow-ups with that like three months later, six months later. So you be a client, come in and tell me what it is you want. And I'll tell you what I'll tell you. <laughs> Coach Jillian, I want meaty thighs. I want a big butt, but I don't want to get fat. <laughs> what do I do? So I honestly would probably ask you what you think of those parts of your body now. Like mm. are your thighs too small? You know, how do you feel about your butt? And I would probably ask you to show me what you thought. I'd be like, pull out your phone, Nikki, and show me what you think is ideal. Mm. And I'll have you show me an image of what that is. Mm -hmm. And I would be very honest with you. I might tell you that like with your body type, you are not going to look like this. Yes, we could put some mass on your thighs. We could grow your butt within reason and stuff. And, you know, have a little bit of a discussion. And sometimes I have discussions that are so elementary to us, mm -hmm. like how, you know, you can't turn muscle into fat, you right. can't turn fat into muscle, mm -hmm. but really having somebody understand their own body and then suggesting that what we do is we take a picture on day one, we follow a program, and then we take a picture, you know, four weeks later, eight weeks later, mm -hmm. so that they're becoming a better version of themselves. So the very first thing we'll do is kind of dismiss the things that we see either on social media mm -hmm. or what they're trying to attain, because I will never be able to get, if you come in and show me a picture of Kim Kardashian's butt, and I was like, <laughs> I want to squat. This is what I, or anybody. <laughs> right. You're like, well, here's the number for a plastic surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I like that. You've taken it from something external that somebody else is and brought it back to like what that person, that client actually has to work with and what's theirs, not what's someone else's. A lot of times people will fixate on if they get those things, mm. they will be happy. Yeah. So I will often send home like a homework assignment, even if it's asking questions like what makes you happy? Like maybe it's just going to be happy to go to their college reunion right. and look great and have somebody tell them that they look great. And there's nothing wrong with an aesthetic goal. But I think that there's this, if I look like this, then all of these things are going to come from it. So, mm -hmm. you know, for me, the whole focus is on education and being realistic with what somebody could expect. How would your conversation change if my answer was, I'm worried that I'm pre-diabetic or my doctor thinks that I'm pre-diabetic? Like, what should I do? I don't want to be operating 
outside of my scope on that. But if you come in well, and say yeah, you're worried, that would be your answer, right? Right. That, yeah. that, that is outside of my scope, but I would yeah. dig a little bit deeper. You know, mm-hmm. are they pre-diabetic right now? Mm-hmm. Is there fear? So many times, either people don't tell us the truth or we don't get the whole story because there are underlying fears. Mm-hmm. So one of the first things I am trying to pull out from somebody is what is their motivation? And often their motivation is the fear. Mm -hmm. So the motivation is, you know, these conditions run in my family. I don't want that to happen to me. Mm -hmm. So when I realize I may be watching somebody squat, but I'm coaching that entire person under that bar, that person that's afraid of either getting fat or, you know, becoming diabetic. And I think my programming doesn't change, but I think my approach to the individual does. Yeah. Does that make any sense? It does. Yeah. I like okay. <laughs> because it seems like, and we've talked about this before, like if we just look at on paper, what we do as coaches, we give people programs, prescriptions, whatever for squatting, bench pressing, pressing and deadlifting. But every person is so different and their reason for doing it is so different. So the outcome is something specific. Like we want to improve their quality of life and make them get to do those things that make them happy. But that outcome is so individual. Yep. But it's interesting how on paper it looks like it's the same, but it really isn't. So I see it like when I'm designing a program for somebody, I see it almost as like the foundation of the house and like the like you're squatting and deadlifting and pressing and all of that stuff. And your linear program is the foundation of the house, mm-hmm. which has to occur. And then I let everybody decorate their house to their tastes. So (laughs) I love this. (laughs) This So so in terms of like decorating house, you know, maybe that person that wants a butt, maybe after they do the meat of their stuff, Mm -hmm. I'm going to give them butt exercises because it makes them feel good. (laughs) That's your housewarming present. (laughs) Here's your butt. Right. (laughs) More health concerns. You know, I invite to the nutrition lectures Yeah, and we go in a different direction. So the base and the foundation is always going to be strong and the same, Mm -hmm. but I'm going to allow people, I'm going to help be their decorator for their individual tastes and needs. You're their Pinterest. Do you know what Pinterest is? You have Pinterest, right? Yes. <laughs> I love that analogy. That's really good. It allows you to know that whatever you want is okay to want. Yes. And we're going to want different things. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes we're going to want to chase strength for a while. Yeah. And then we're going to go get ready to go someplace and our jeans aren't going to fit. Or, you know, it's going to be hard to zipper up the back of your dress. And in an instant, you're just going to question everything that you've been doing. Mm -hmm. I've been there. I've done that. I'm so proud. Like for me with body image, I'm so proud of myself when I'm in the gym and I'm strong. And I feel great. Mm -hmm. And then I get out into real life and I go shopping, whether if it's for dress clothes or a suit or I have to go to a formal occasion and things don't fit correctly and your whole world is blown. Mm -hmm. Well, what's that conversation we just had about the hoodie size that you were going to (laughs) get? All right. So it's kind of a funny story. Um, I wanted to order one of the awesome Barbell Logic hoodies which I love. <laughs> it's really cozy. I've worn one all weekend. <laughs> I asked Nikki, how big are the armholes mm-hmm. and how big is the head hole? <laughs> so those of you that are, have seen me, I have a big head, lots I and never, lots of hair. I <laughs> never knew what the size of your head was. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the hair, but I have like ridiculously big arms They're that gorgeous. I've had my whole life. Yeah. Like I was a gymnast mm-hmm. and I always used to want to wear Lululemon clothes and didn't understand that maybe like they weren't meant for me. Mm. So I had this trick. I used to buy two liter bottles of soda and I would stuff the full two liter bottles in the armholes of the sweatshirts and I would leave them overnight to stretch the armholes. (laughs) (laughs) Happy to say that I ordered a Barbell Logic medium sweatshirt and it fits great and my arms fit. That's such a real thing, though. Like, that's happened to me, too, where I'll, like, want to share clothes with, like, my sister or my friend. It's, like, my lats and arms are too big that it's just, like, people don't understand. Like, my sister-in-law wanted to buy me a dress, and I was, like, well, I can't actually wear any of those because my lats are too big and I won't be able to zip up anything. And it makes me feel, like, I used to feel, I think, pretty uncomfortable about it, but it's, like, there are things that you have to learn about the longer you do this, about how to make sure that you know how to make stuff work for how your body is because your body is how you want it to be. So there are fashions that you can't wear. The first one is understanding that that's (laughs) going to be the case. Be willing for me at least to buy a size up and then be like, if it's a good piece of clothing, I'm going to go and get it altered and tailored. Ooh, yeah. Like rather than to dismiss something Mm -hmm. completely. And if I ever retire from this profession and decide to do something else, I will probably design clothing for very muscular (gasps) athletic women. 
Oh, I love that idea. That would be great. <laughs> like, I want everything open back, just for the record, because we all have fantastic bags. <laughs> I think we have a great selection of workout clothes, mm-hmm. but we don't have, I mean, there have been lots of times in my life where I've, I've needed professional attire. Yeah. You know, whether that's a suit, you know, just any kind of professional attire or a gown, and I don't have choices. So what do you do when a client comes to you and they've just had that moment of just like, oh, well, I have this interview or I have this wedding I have to go to. And I just realized that I've been in my workout clothes and I love everything about myself, but now I don't fit in the real world and they freak out and they want to change everything. So I will help with my little clothing tricks and Mm -hmm. explain that this is, and I'll talk to them, you know, about the personal experience for me, whether it's to tell the story about stretching the armholes Mm -hmm. or having to buy a dress four or five sizes too large Mm -hmm. and then have the middle taken in and stuff and talk about like how designers design things for like either for a model or for the average. Right. And you're not average, you're extraordinary. So you're not going to fit into this box Mm -hmm. and have them kind of have fun with it. Yeah. But I think that's something when we talk about body image and lifting, that's very common. I think for the most part, we embrace the results from it, but Mm -hmm. there are definitely going to be moments whether somebody says something to you, like a negative comment in an instant could take you down. Mm, right. Yeah. Something that you didn't realize you were insecure about. And you're like, oh, that's something that people see. Gosh. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> yeah. I love the concept of strength training is kind of similar to your foundation. Like with strength training, we take what you already have and what you love and we just give you more of it instead of trying to take away from you. I feel like if we're too obsessed with what other people look like, we end up wanting to have less of ourselves. And I like what we do because we end up with more of ourselves, not necessarily more mass, but it's just like we see more of ourselves for what we are and we kind of get to embellish that. And that's the fun of what we do. Another thing is being part for women like that, having a community where there's other women that are like you. Yeah. You know, it's very difficult when it's something you go and do on your own. And then, you know, your friends, your coworkers don't do that at all. And you're the one that's different. Mm -hmm. So I think it's amazing to have a community, whether online or real life, that there are women that could share the same experiences. Like Mm -hmm. we could both talk about not being able to zip a dress or like, you know, finding a pair of jeans. Yeah. And it's like, I know men go through this too, because they get thick legs and, you know, waist sizes change and your erectors get meatier. So shirts and pants fit differently, but it's like, you shop and you end up looking not sexy or attractive in clothes because they just weren't made for your body. So it just kind of feels crappy until you figure out how to dress for your body. And like you said, talk to other people who know how to do it. Completely agree. (laughs) I'm curious, like, it seems like in the beginning, when someone starts lifting and strength training, they have, they're ready to make a whole bunch of changes. But being in this field and having this hobby or competitive drive for years and years and years, like what does a successful relationship look like in your opinion with your body image? I agree with what you just said. And I think the newness wears off. Body image is, I want to say it exists on a continuum. Like you could have ups and downs about it. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how you feel about it, but I could have a day where I feel great about the way I look Mm -hmm. and the next day not feel great about how I look. I think first, if somebody's going to lift, they have to identify or do anything in fitness, their reasons for doing it and have some reasons that are not entirely connected to what they look like. I know for me, my thought is that my form, like my physique, my form follows function. So the more I explore what I can do and the greater function I have will lead to a greater form. And that's for me, how I look at it. That's cool. Okay. But I think sometimes even the further along you get, the harder you are on yourself. And I don't know if you've seen that for people that are training for a while. And I think just having realistic expectations and again, a hard conversation with somebody is oftentimes people are not, don't believe they're getting out what they put in. Mm, Yeah. And I think having a realistic look and sitting down with somebody and say, you train this many hours per week, you eat you know, this is what your diet looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, we all just recently watched something like the CrossFit Games and people think, oh, I'm going to look like this person. Right. You know, do you realize, I mean, obviously you're genetically different people. You're probably possibly 20 or 30 years older than that person. Mm -hmm. This is not what you do for a living. 
you do not put those things in. So I think someone having a realistic expectation and once you make peace with the expectations, Mm -hmm. um, don't need to have a lesser expectation. So I'm not saying somebody should reduce what they expect, but having a realistic expectation of what training is going to do for you. Mm. Like you're still gonna be you at the end of the day. Right, like you just mentioned, how many times per week you're training or how many hours you're training, what their calories are. Like what are other like actual objective things that you can or we can draw our attention to when we just have that feeling of, well, I look terrible and I hate this. <laughs> Again, I mean, <laughs> I don't have a degree in psychology, but when somebody says they look terrible and they hate this, I want to know what prompted them to feel that way. Mm-hmm. Was it an experience in a dressing room? Mm-hmm. Did somebody make a comment? Is there something going on at home? Is there something else going on in their life that they feel that way? Mm-hmm. So I want to know what the I look terrible and I hate this is coming from. Sometimes the I look terrible and I hate this is coming from not making the progress they think they should be making. So it's like, right. you know, I, if I was making this progress, then I could accept this. So with me, when someone says that, I want to get to what's behind the I look terrible and I hate this. Mm-hmm. That's something that we could probably do for ourselves too when we have one of those days, just like, oh, like, like you said, we have one day where we're just like, ah, oh, body of a goddess, like, <laughs> come on, get over here, Vogue magazine. <laughs> like, and then like the next day you're like, well, I'm just going to go hide in my garage all day because... I'm so embarrassed about everything. (laughs) But that's what I say. It's so subjective. Mm -hmm. You could have the same body. You could stand on two different (laughs) angles and take two different pictures. Yeah. And love your body in one and hate your body in the other. So true. You know, you could put on two different pairs of jeans and love your body in one and hate your body in the other. Yeah. So one of the exercises I do with my younger girls is to have them write down, you know, the things that they love about their body. Mm -hmm. That's fun. So again, because it changes, like, I mean, for you, give me an example of a time that you feel like you hated your body. I used to really hate my arms. I was super embarrassed about my arms in high school because they're, I've always had like kind of thick arms, but now I love them. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to tell a personal, but um, kind of embarrassing story. I may have once told this. Um, I've also always had ridiculously large arms. They were always very muscular and when I was in high school, a local news reporter came to do a story on me after I won the national fitness championship. And the opening line was beneath her baggy shirt are biceps bigger than all of the boys. Hmm. So this ran in the newspaper and I was hysterical when I saw it because I was so self-conscious about that. Like that is not how I wanted the opening of the article to be. And the hmm. title of the article was, is she human? So all of that was just you know, (laughs) very difficult on a 17 year old's mind. Totally. And I wanted to go buy all the newspapers from all the stores so that nobody else could buy them and read them. Mm, That really got you. And I think taking something that was something that I've been so self-conscious about that Mm -hmm. people, you know, it's always like, and the other thing is when you're different, we're taught, like you don't go touch I don't go up and grab a fat person and be like, let me see how squishy this is. Mm -hmm. And I personally don't reach out to like a woman that I don't know, a pregnant woman and touch her belly, or I don't go grab somebody like, but people believe because you're muscular, you know, that, that they have their right sometimes to put their hands on you. Oh, weird. So all the time, like somebody will reach out and I'm like, I should have the same amount of like privacy in my own space as anybody else. Yeah. I didn't create my body for anybody else. And I think that's another misperception Mm -hmm. with people that really take care of their bodies or muscular women that like you've done it for somebody other than yourself. Yeah. You have to do it for yourself or else there's no joy. (laughs) (laughs) What do you think, because I think this is so very much related, like what does a long-term good relationship with eating mean? I think that that is a great question because I don't believe we all view food the same. I believe there are people that view food only as fuel. Yeah. I'm not one of those people. Like I believe that food nourishes the body. And I also believe there there are times and places for the food to nourish the soul. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's going to be a lot of people in the nutrition community that's like really want like food to be about specifically fuel and nourishment. Mm -hmm. But I think those are hard things to separate. And I think long-term, I mean, ideally long-term, it's about finding balance. One of the things like I like to look at for somebody long-term is that they have a relatively stable body weight. 
Like one of the oh, things cool. that we see as mm-hmm. something that, you know, and something even I struggled with, you know, as years as a bodybuilder, like having, like, I want to have one me. So I want to be the same Jillian in January mm-hmm. as I am in August. Yeah, And I think finding a sustainable nutrition plan that's the same rather than gaining and losing weight in the cyclical pattern is bad for anybody. Mm-hmm. So that's something when I think of a long-term relationship, I think of somebody as having relatively stable a stable body, yeah. not ups and downs and ups and downs and chronic dieting. And the other thing is to find nutrition that doesn't feel like, I know people that live on a diet, 100% of the time they live deprived. Mm-hmm. The goal when I work with people is getting to people to a point where they enjoy their nutrition, they're making the right choices, but they don't feel deprived. Mm-hmm. I think that's one thing that I've learned is by not feeling deprived, I feel like I can eat really well when I want to be eating really well. But then sometimes I'll want to be like, you know what, I'm not going to eat well and I'm going to have a burger and I'm going to have a couple glasses of wine. In the past, I think if I was going to have that meal, I was like committing myself to being like, well, now I, I'm a slob and I don't know how to stick to my diet. And just by wanting to have that one little meal or whatever, I just felt like I was becoming a different person. Whereas now... Like, it's just like, well, that just means that I'm having a burger and a couple of glasses of wine. It's literally all that it means. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. It's learning how to have those meals, not to have guilt surrounded by those, not to punish yourself yeah, and how to pick right back up where you left off, not to feel all of those negative thoughts and to come off and be like, well, my diet's out the window or I've ruined this or right. to think that you lack willpower. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not always or necessarily a lack of willpower. Sometimes, you know, you're making a choice yeah. to eat those things and to see it as just a continuation. It's not on a diet, off a diet, on a plan, off a plan. And it's one of the ways I like to look at it is every time you eat, you have an opportunity to make a choice. You're gonna make the best choice you can. And then guess what? Three hours later, you get another opportunity to make a choice. So I see each meal Mm -hmm. as a choice to make my best choice. And sometimes I'm going to make poor choices. But overall, if all of the good choices win, Mm -hmm. I'm doing well. Yeah, I like that. But you're not dooming yourself to be like, you're not putting yourself on a pedestal, nor are you putting yourself in the gutter. It's just the one Jillian making choices. Which is very difficult. It has been incredibly, incredibly difficult to get there, especially coming from somebody that's I grew up as a gymnast where body image is huge. Yeah, you've done bodybuilding and gymnastics, like. Correct. Wow. Yep. And there's a lot of pressure to be small. There's a lot of pressure to be lean. Mm -hmm. And for me, I believe that I may have continued even longer in bodybuilding, but recognized that it was unhealthy for me. So eating that way and being so restricted to me led to the complete opposite. Like with a deprivation for that long, I'm going to go to the other extreme, which created somewhat of disordered eating. And I recognized like, I do like this sport and I think I possibly had further to go in it, mm-hmm. but this is not healthy for me. So if you had, make you do a list. If you had maybe a top three pieces of advice to give someone who knows they love lifting, maybe they're new, maybe they've been experienced, like what are a couple of things you would tell them just to make sure they keep making choices that make them come back to themselves and kind of enjoy themselves and their body for the long term of lifting and eating? It's kind of a big ask. (laughs) That is quite a big ask. I'm going to go back to one that's been super important and helpful to me which is to keep a journal. Oh, yeah. Because sometimes when we do get down about these things, like I said before, they're coming from other places. Mm -hmm. I find that journal helpful. And whether that journal is even a lifting log, sometimes it's just amazing to go back and look like, you know, last week I PR'd my squat. Mm -hmm. And also to align there, it's okay to have aesthetic goals. But what I do is I like to align each of those aesthetic goals even with something in the physical realm. So let's say an aesthetic goal is I want my butt, you know, to be rounder. Mm -hmm. So I may say, okay, on the line right next to that, tell me what you want your squat to be. Mm -hmm. So I want measurable things Mm -hmm. because, you know, we're often looking at things differently. So um, journaling, measurable things in terms of outcomes and goals and getting rid of the noise, like surrounding yourself, focusing, taking more time to focus on yourself and less time. I find... I feel the worst about myself when I look at other people Mm -hmm. and when I become too distracted with that, Mm -hmm. you know, whether it's social media, 
and looking at things that are just a waste of time. Like that could be spent, you know, doing things positive for ourselves and not looking at bodies that we can never have. Yeah. Those are amazing. I don't know if I said three. I'm I think, all over No, those the place. are perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You said journaling, finding something objective that can go align with something subjective and then yep. making sure you're not in spaces or doing things that make you focus on other people that you would want to compare yourself to. I want to come back full circle this. We talked about women and, you know, maybe body image and putting on weight with lifting. I also want to address women, men that don't feel like they're doing all of the lifting and they're not as big or as muscular mm. as they feel like they should be. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, how many men or people even get into lifting weights because they want to look bigger and stronger? Mm-hmm and stuff like that. I want to be huge. And again, for me, that comes back to the psychology of it is if you had 20 more pounds on you, you know, would you be treated differently? Would this happen? And understanding why is that goal what's important? Is it really 20 pounds or is that something else? Is it you don't feel like, you know, you're respected in a certain way? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you did get into a fight and get beat up, but I want to understand where that's coming from. And is it coming from, you know, wanting to put 20 more pounds on or be huge? Or is it a physical strength thing? So the same thing I talked about with women and sitting them down and talking about that is going to apply to anybody. When they express a physical ideal, I want to know why it is that they've chosen that physical ideal. I like that idea a lot because it can really, it seems like having that conversation would take what you would think is the, the goal and then it actually turns into being something else entirely that you actually have more control over. I have also found that when I have people that feel the most unhappy with my women over the years with how they look, finding a goal for them, whether it be a powerlifting meet, whether it's a Spartan race, anything, and getting out there and training for something and going out there as a team, Mm -hmm. they forget about that they were complaining that they didn't like what they looked Mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Was that a coherent sentence? I think it was. Audience, what do you think was that a coherent sentence? (laughs) By getting them to do something and train for an event or even with the team, they forget about that idea that they don't like what they look like, right? That's what you said. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Until you tell them they have to put on a singlet. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, That's... <laughs> for this, you have to wear a singlet. Oh, and then you have to put on a belt, which is going to just smush everything around. Oh, and you're going to be in front of a bunch of people. <laughs> but good news, everybody's there wearing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. The singlet. Man, how long has it been since you wore a lifting singlet? I like to try them on sometimes. (laughs) So I want to say I might be, maybe did a little costume demo with my lifting and wrestling singlets and stuff. So I don't know, six months ago. (laughs) But a legitimate lifting singlet, it's been four years. Yeah. Yeah, I think mine is a year and a half now. Yeah. It's tough to feel confident when you're wearing that. So you really just have to like just dissociate. (laughs) (laughs) And be like, yes, I am wearing this ridiculous outfit, but I'm also about to go squat whatever pounds. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Well, cool. I think that is really helpful for everybody who's just getting into this or people who have been in it for a long time. It's like constant reminders of how to kind of zoom out, keep doubling down on the whys figuring out why we're doing this and just kind of remember that it's like, we all have our own journeys that can change and that's okay, which is cool. So I have one more thought to add on that. Oh yeah. A lot of the time, the population that I worked with were at the old gym and before women in their thirties, forties, fifties, and they would say these things. And I would say, if your daughter had asked you the same question, what would you tell them? Mm. Like turn it around. You know, you're not going to make it about body image. Like if their teenage daughter wanted to start weightlifting and the reasoning, I think encouraging them to see it through a different set of eyes and the example that they would want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, spin it on its head. So it's like, well, what would someone who really cares about you and who's nice to you, someone who you care for, who you want to be nice to and actually help foster a good learning and growing environment, what would you say to them versus us who can be really... Uh, very hard on ourselves. <laughs> yep. And one of the other things in my gym is we never talked 
we would talk about how strong we'd say you're so strong or that was such a great lift or their form was so great. Mm -hmm. We would never say, oh, you look thinner. Like we, mm -hmm. and we kept all of the comments about performance and not about somebody's bodies. Yeah. Or even if it's a positive comment, it could instantly make somebody feel incredibly either insecure or yeah. embarrassed. I mean, maybe, oh, you looked so much thinner and that's not what the person is going for. Mm, mm -hmm. So, you know, it was somewhat a little bit in the etiquette and learning about being in the environment mm -hmm. was to talk about encouraging people in a positive way mm -hmm. and not commenting physically about what they looked like. Ooh, that sounds like something we could all do for each other. I like that. Yeah. That makes me want to just do a whole episode on social media. <laughs> <laughs> Well, fantastic. So cool. Thank you, Jillian. And thanks everybody for listening. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's a blast. We're going to get to do a lot more, which I'm very grateful for. <laughs> cool. Cool.